Hugo in a few seconds if you want to go and go live. They're coming in. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our virtual Darwin Day. Thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is Nancy, and I will be your host. And with me is Dr. Roland Case. Uh, he is a research professor at NC State University, and he's also the head of the Biodiversity Lab in the Nature Research Center at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. And you might have seen him working in his lab on the second floor of the NRC, or you might also have seen him uh, in, in, in one of his incredible YouTube videos titled, uh, You Won't Believe, they're pretty cool. Um, but he came up with a pretty uh, interesting icebreaker question that's very relevant to his talk. And he wants to know, uh, which wild animal do you think is the least afraid of people? Just to get the chat going, so please feel free to put that in the chat. And uh, while you are doing that, we are going to just uh, go over uh, a quick Zoom tutorial just to make sure that everybody has a good um, uh, Zoom experience right here. And I'm going to share this with you. So first of all, um, this uh, presentation will be recorded. And um, that means that uh, all of the videos will be turned off and uh, your mics will be muted as well. Uh, but a closed captioning is available. So you simply have to click on that little CC button at the bottom of your uh, control bar. And uh, when you do that, you will be able to um, click on show subtitles. And when you click on that, you will have the screen here where you can actually adjust uh, the size and the font actually of, of your uh, captioning. And it will just uh, say that throughout the rest of the presentation. Now, as you can see, we have our speaker and our guests, our Darwin guests, uh, obscuring our slideshow. So what we recommend is that you click on that little speaker view button at the top. And then you also have to click on um, the side by side mode. Uh, that way, if you do that, uh, the speaker will be next to the presentation. And then you can also adjust the size of your presentation by moving that slider to either the left or the right. And then last but not least, we really want to hear from you. So please put all your comments and your observations and your questions in the chat. Uh, we will save all those questions at the end. Um, but um, so when you're typing your, your questions and your comments in the chat, just remind, just a reminder to be good digital citizens. So please don't spam the chat or um, you know, make also sure that your comments and your questions are relevant to the topic and just be um, respectful and kind to everybody else. And with that, I'm gonna stop sharing because I would love to introduce to you to Dr. Roland Case. Hello, how are you doing today? I'm good, thanks, how are you? Good, I have heard that um, you are a zoologist, right? And you are mostly interested in ecology and conservation, and you're especially interested in mammals. And it seems that you're always looking for questions that are really um, scientifically interesting, but they also have a real world relevance. And I know that you're gonna tackle the questions, do hunters change the landscape of fear for wildlife? So I'm very interested to, to kind of like hear what you discovered. Great, well, I'll uh, go ahead and get started then. Thanks for the introduction. Um, and uh, yeah, so my topic today is the landscape of fear and uh, you'll see why this is relevant for Darwin Day. And um, <clears throat> if you don't know what the landscape of fear is, I'll explain that in a second too. But I want to start by sort of stepping back um, and talking about uh, evolution and natural selection, right? Natural selection are the sort of forces that shape how animals evolve by shaping how they survive and how they, re how they reproduce. 
And we've got these sort of typical things, finding food, avoiding predators, you know, staying healthy. Um, obviously, you need to find a mate and, and find shelter. But of these, I think, you know, predation and, and to some extent disease is super and super important because there's just no room for error, right? If you avoid, if you miss getting lunch someday, well, you'll make it up. You know, you can, you can get it later. If you miss finding shelter, you might be a little cold, but you'll probably survive. If you miss avoiding a predator, right? If this gazelle misses realizing that this cheetah is coming after it just for a second, it's done. It's done. And so there's really uh, sort of sharp, this uh, intense pressure for animals to figure out how to avoid predators. And that shapes obviously how fast they run, how they defend themselves, how they have their vision and their sense of smell and hearing, all these things together, right? Um, but uh, I want to talk also about how this changes their behavior. And um, a lot of this comes through fear, right? Fear is how we know to avoid dangerous places. Like this woman did not listen to her fear, right? She obviously went to a very dangerous place at a dangerous time of day. It looks all spooky and she's now terrified. But the idea really is that the fear shapes the behavior before you do it so that you avoid those dangerous places. And just like we, you know, fear is a very human emotion, but of course it's going to be out there in all kinds of other animals, whether it's the same sort of emotion that we feel uh, or some, uh, you know, we have no idea how it actually manifests in their brain, but we know that it's important to them. Um, and, and this shapes what we call the landscape of fear. And so um, here you can see a, a little cartoony version, right? And on the left side, there's no wolves. And the elk are all like totally chilled out. They have no fear. They, they're eating a lot. Um, whereas on the right side, there are wolves. And so those elk are nervous. They're running around. They're looking around, right? They have fear. And so that's one thing, obviously, it's just if you have predators or you don't have predators or you have a lot of predators or you have few predators, that's going to affect how fearful and how those animals behave. Um, but you can also have a more fine scale difference. If you look over on the right, um, those elk in the forests are safer. So sometimes you get certain habitat features that make you safer or make you more vulnerable to predation. And so you're going to, these animals have this sense of fear that if I go out into the open, in this case, the wolves might get me. And so I'm going to spend more time in the forest where I'm safe. And so this can shape how they move around in the landscape. Um, and it can, it can differ for different species, right? For uh, an animal that can run really fast, maybe the open country is safer and the forest, they would get all tangled up. But maybe for another species that's adapted to hiding, maybe the forest would, forest would be better. And if they were stuck out there in the open, they'd be dead meat. So the point is that these um, sort of fear effects are going to be species specific depending on basically, you know, how they've evolved in the past. So how do you know if an animal's afraid? We can't just go elk, ask this elk, hey, are you nervous right now? Um, but we can look at their behaviors. And one example that works really well is vigilance, right? This elk on the right, his head is up, he's looking around, uh, he's aware of what's going on. Um, the one on the left is eating. So for a lot of animals, you're either eating or you're looking for predators. So that's a great dynamic that we can count up. How much time is their head up? How much time is their head down? That's an indication of how nervous they are, how, how much fear they have. Um, and but also we can just tell by their by their movement, by where they position themselves. And we know from a, a really nice series of experiments that squirrels, one of the pre premier, uh, one of the, the most important factors to how nervous, how fearful a squirrel is, is how far it is from a tree. Right? This guy found something to eat, took it over to the tree, and is sitting right there. And if a dog shows up, boom, he'll be up the tree in no time. Right? Now, if he was if he was 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 feet away, there'd be uh, more risk and he'd be more fearful and he'll make different feeding decisions. He won't hang out there and eat because he knows he's more at risk. So we can uh, quantify these kinds of, of features and start to look at how animals are using the landscape. And this matters. It, we have seen some really uh, dramatic ecological um, changes due to these fear effects. And the most famous example is in Yellowstone uh, you may have seen there's a, a famous YouTube video called Hot, How Wolves Change Rivers. Um, and while some of the finer points of these, are, uh, this is still sort of debated among scientists, it's clear that before wolves were reintroduced to Yellowstone, you have that image on the left where 
the elk were grazing right down in the river all over the place, eating all the willows that were trying to grow up, all the little shoots of the young trees. And um, uh, you had a lot more erosion and a lot less green gr greenery. Uh, when the wolves moved in, they hunted along these rivers a lot. The elk realized uh, that was a pretty dangerous place to hang out. So they, de they decreased their feeding. They spent more time feeding elsewhere. Um, and the vegetation grew back. Uh, the beavers came back and, and sort of changed the watercourse level. There was lots of, of, of new vegetation for birds. There's all kinds of things that changed just because the elk, now the elk were slightly less abundant as well, but one of the most important things was just they they weren't spending the time uh, just decimating all these willows along the river before. So the point is that fear can have uh, uh, these cascading effects throughout the ecosystem. Now, one of the interesting things about North Carolina is in most of the state, we've lost our largest predators, right? We had cougars, also known as mountain lions, panthers, the same thing. Uh, and we had, we had wolves uh, across the state. And um, those are now gone. Right, we don't have them here anymore. The the range map here, the red is where cougars still live. The purple is where gray wolves still live. We still have a very small population of red wolves along the coast, but for the most part in North Carolina and the rest of the East Coast, um, something like a deer doesn't have a whole lot to worry about. Uh, the coyotes are not very good predators of them, and um, and so you know their fear may have disappeared except for the human hunters, right? So we still have a lot of human hunters out in the landscape. So this is kind of getting around to my question here today is can human hunters create a landscape of fear for wildlife? And we know there are certainly a lot of hunters in the United States, um, 11 million hunters estimated across the country, 250,000 in North Carolina. They shot last year, almost 170,000 deer. So that's a big harvest. Uh, and so there's a lot of deer that, uh, you know, it's a lot of natural selection from an evolutionary point of view of deer that are dying uh, due to hunters. So you would think there might be some response to that. Um, you know, but on the other hand, there's a lot of limits to hunting. We're not hunting all year round. Um, there are, this is the rule book for North Carolina. And, um, and so uh, it's, not, um, it's not the same as a mountain lion that's going to be out there 24-7 uh, doing anything they can do uh, to get uh, a deer. So, you know, the great thing is what this wildlife management, all these rules really saved our, our fauna, right? A lot of our turkeys and deer and bears, they were on their way to extinction. We said, wait a second, slow down the hunting, let's follow some rules, and that's allowed them to recover. Um, but you know, now there's, there's fewer hunters every year, and uh, we wonder, are these rules um, eh, too strict to actually allow hunters to have a strong fear effect on wildlife? Um, and had the hunt animals lost their fear of people? Uh, to, you know, we had a little discussion at the beginning about the geese, no doubt they've lost their fear of people, right? And does it matter? Uh, I step in goose poop a lot on my on my street, and um, that's not that big of a deal, right? But but there could be other ecological impacts, like we saw in Yellowstone. Here's some deer, not afraid, right? Walking right between two um, two houses with a a giant, uh, you know, with three fawns. That's a not a very. She looks a little nervous, but uh, you know, just the fact that they're there shows that they're not very fearful. And too many deer uh, can be really damaging. You look at that picture of a browse line, you see everything above where a deer can reach is green. Anything below where the deer can reach, if it was green, it's been eaten. They can have a huge impact on forestry, on forest regeneration, on agriculture. Uh, all the birds that rely on that understory vegetation uh, have nowhere to go. Um, they can also, uh, deer uh, can carry, the ticks that carry Lyme disease, so they're potentially implicated in that. Uh, pro and that problem. And then there's a roadkill estimated in the United States at a million a year um, with uh, $10 billion of damage and 200 human deaths, probably a lot more uh, deer deaths. So uh, the point is there are some signs that maybe not everywhere, but in some places we have too many deer and or they are getting too bold. So, you know, I was kind of wondering, could we change the hunting practices to change deer behavior and change their ecological impact? So how would we do that, right? How would we do this experiment? We would maybe say, okay, in half of North Carolina, we're going to change the hunting rules and in the other half we're not. That would be, that would be a complicated experiment. Uh, it would be very difficult. It would take a long time. It might take a long time. We don't know how long it would take for these, uh, um, the deer to start responding. Um, so we decided to take another approach and do a comparison approach um, 
between the United States, North Carolina in particular, and Germany, where the hunting rules are a lot different. So this is what I'm going to talk to you about today, comparing the animals in North Carolina and Germany. Um, so a little introduction to German hunting. They've been doing it obviously a long time. Um, here you can see an old painting of them chasing a stag with their horns, blowing their horns. They've got their dogs. Uh, they're, they're pursuing the prey, uh, um, you know, quite intensely. Um, and here's some modern hunters uh, still with their dogs, still with their horns. Um, and uh, it, it is a more intense harvest. If you look at the number of animals they kill in Germany compared to North Carolina um, as a sort of, you know, per air, uh, square mile, it's about four times higher. Uh, so it is a much more intense harvest. Um, and there's a whole bunch of differences between German hunting and American hunting that I don't, I don't want to go into great detail. Um, they, uh, in Germany, they hunt mostly on private land. There's a lot fewer hunters and the regulations are generally um, put out and organized by the local communities uh, at a smaller level. Whereas in the United States, it's mostly regulated at the state level. Um, there's generally more hunters. It's um, a lot uh, bigger swath of the community that's involved in the hunting. And we have a good a number of, of public lands in addition to private lands that are hunted. So um, the regulations are quite different, right? So in North Carolina, uh, you can hunt six deer, uh, one bear and three turkey per year. That's the bag limit, right? Um, there are no bag limits in Germany. Got an asterisk there because the, they will be set locally, um, but they're certainly um, hunting a lot more animals. Um, the season for, depending exactly which, if you're bow or, or gun, it's three months for deer, two months for bear, one month for turkey. Um, in Germany, deer, it's nine months, and for hogs, it's year round. Um, and game drives are allowed in, Ger in Germany with the dogs and the horns, uh, but not so uh, much. I mean, we can hunt with dogs, but it's not kind of the organized take a forest and try to push all the deer out kind of thing. So a lot of this is driven by this German hunting principle, which I'm probably going to pronounce wrong, but uh, Wald vor Wild, which means forest before game. And this is a principle that a lot of their sort of management is around the idea that they need to protect their forests. And if the hogs and deer become overabundant, they'll damage the forest. So they're hunting the, to the game to bring them to lower levels to protect their forest. And um, this is a kind of a general principle across much of Germany, but I like to point out that not all German hunters like this policy. Uh, it's been interesting for me to sort of learn more about this side of things. Um, and um, some of them feel like they're, they're, they're over hunting and uh, makes recreational hunting more difficult. But they do kill a lot of animals. Uh, a lot of times they'll sort of celebrate it and show off uh, what they've done. And sometimes the communities are, are quite happy. I mean, look at all these wild hogs that they've removed from the local forest, which could potentially be a pest. So um, certainly some groups are, are happy to see this. Um, and they do have some nice forest and they protect their forest by doing this. So um, that's kind of got you caught up on the, the German hunting situation. And I've come to my hypothesis, which is that the more sustained and intensive hunting pressure in Germany will result in hunted species being less abundant and more fearful of humans than those in North, in North America or in North Carolina in particular. Um, and so we're working in particular in uh, southern Germany, which is similar to Raleigh. Um, it's got the similar elevation, almost exactly the same rainfall. Temperature is pretty similar. Raleigh's a little bit warmer. Um, gross primary productivity is uh, kind of a jargony name, but that's a, a measure that we can take of an area to see how much plant productivity is there. And they're, they're basically the same. Uh, we both have a sort of a, a mix of forest and coniferous, uh, deciduous and coniferous forest. Um, and we use camera traps in this project to compare the wildlife. So these are motion sensitive cameras, put them out and any animal that walks by, you get a picture and we count them up. Um, and we stratified our cameras between forest fields and yards, right? So we set a lot of cameras right in backyards um, to see how close are our animals coming to people. And then uh, outside of the backyards, we've got some in agricultural fields and some in forests. On the North Carolina side, this was part of our Candid Critters project, which was a three-year citizen science project all across the state, uh, sponsored by the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. Uh, we got cameras into all 100 counties um, and um, uh, working some with the, uh, with the, the uh, game wardens at the Wildlife Resources Commission as well. Uh, sampled in total over 4,000 locations, although for this project, we just picked a subset of those 
that match best with what we did in Germany. So in Germany, we worked with uh, my colleague, Martin Wachelski and Brigitte Keeves, who are at the Max Planck Institute of Animal Behavior. And uh, I was visiting Martin and, you know, checking out some of the, the properties around there and, and just asking a lot of questions about the hunting because it was interested to see how different it was. And we started to realize that we thought there were probably some big differences in the animal behavior. Um, Martin himself has lived in New Jersey and he remembered the deer in his backyard there all the time and said, it doesn't seem to be happening here in Germany. So we said, well, let's see if we can really quantify this and see if the cameras can get us some data that match kind of your observation as a naturalist. Um, so here's the points that we ran. Uh, each pink dot is a camera. So the top map, you can see Raleigh there. So it was kind of Raleigh down to the coast, uh, down towards the coast. Um, and then in Germany, it's around Constance and kind of a circle above about the same area around Constance. In each place, we had 243 camera locations. So again, we subsetted the American data to kind of match the study design that we had in Germany. And here's what those places look like. Um, there you can see Constance on, uh, on the lake uh, and Raleigh, uh, a little bit different in the settlement design, but as you get out into the countryside, right, a similar mix of sort of fields and forests. Uh, a lot of their villages tend to be a little bit more compact and our rural development tends to be a little bit more spread out. So that was another difference that we, we tried to control for. Um, but again, here's a, a picture of a, of a German community and how we would kind of run cameras in the yards, in the fields, and in the forest, also in the United States. Whoops. So let's meet some of the characters in our story today on the German side. Um, you know, one of the big game species is the roe deer. Um, here you can see a beautiful male in the forest. Um, they've also got wild boar, which are native in Europe. Um, now, we do have some wild boar in North Carolina, but there were very few or none in the area that we worked. So um, we're not considering, we don't have any data for them from North Carolina, but they're they're very common and much more um, important um, as a game species in Germany. Um, red squirrel, pretty cute, kind of like the gray squirrel, but uh, red um, in Europe. Now they've got hedgehogs, which are awesome. Uh, so cool. Most of them we got at night. This is their only daytime picture. But you can see right in someone's backyard, cruising by. Um, we've got European hares, uh, domestic cats, of course, lots of cats there. Uh, the red fox is cool because it's the same species in North Carolina and in Germany. Um, we also have gray fox, but uh, they have red fox. Um, pretty common there. Uh, they've got European badger, which is super cool. And uh, the stone mark, which is definitely, I have to say, my favorite. Um, it's basically the size of a ferret. And you can see it's right in someone's backyard. You can see the laundries out there. They are all over the backyards in Europe. Um, and there also is another martin called a pine martin, which we only saw in the forest um, that's very similar. So if we look at the similarities between the two countries in terms of their faunas, um, we have the red deer, uh, the roe deer and the white-tailed deer being pretty similar species. Um, the red fox and the red fox uh, the red squirrel being a similar analog to our eastern gray squirrel. Um, and then the badger, in some ways, is similar to the raccoons um, in terms of the types of things that they're eating. Uh, but then we've got some other things, these unique things like martins, boars, and hedgehogs over in Germany. And then on our side, we've got coyotes, bears, bobcats, you know, possums, gray foxes, a variety of other things. So it's not a perfect match, but we do have some pretty, pretty uh, similar creatures. So the first result was that heavily hunted species were substantially more abundant in North Carolina than Germany. Um, and these graphs are showing you on the left for Germany, on the right for the United States, on the y-axis is a relative abundance, which is basically how many pictures per day do we get if we put a camera out in these two countries. And so you can see just at a very coarse scale, white-tailed deer over there on the right for the United States is super abundant and is, is one of our heavily hunted species um, and if you look on the other side, the roe deer is much less common. And if you keep going down, things like the wild boar are also much less common. So this is a very, a very rough cut, but it does support our uh, hypothesis. But let's look, at, let, let's, you know, to really get into this fear thing, we need to look in a little bit more detail. Where do they actually spend their time? And we do this at a fine scale and a large scale. From the fine scale, it's like, are they in the yards or not, right? Are they coming right up to people's houses? And then at a larger scale, we can say, okay, well, in say a square kilometer that's got more or less developed, you find more or less animals. So we can kind of do it at a larger, at a very fine scale, just with the yards, and then at a larger kind of landscape scale. So let's talk about the yards first. This is what we found in North Carolina. 
Um, you can see at the bottom there, white-tailed deer, very common in yards on the right where it's blue, but also uh, at our other sites that were not yards, like fields and forests, also about the same abundance. They really don't care. They're common everywhere, all over the place. However, if you go to things like gray squirrels and raccoons, you can see they're more high. They're higher on the blue side, so they're more common in yards. Um, and you know, even turkeys, which are a hunted species, were more common in yards than not. Um, so remember this deer result, and I'm going to flip to Germany here and look at the deer on the bottom. Almost none in yards at all. A fair amount outside of yards, but they're really not using yards as habitat. Meanwhile, the red foxes. They go crazy in yards. They're there all the time. We get tons of pictures of red foxes. Um, and also, I mentioned my, my favorite uh, favorite ferret, the stone martin there at the top. You can see quite abundant, uh, in addition to the red squirrel and the badger. Wild boar, heavily hunted species, not a single picture in the yards. Um, so this supports our hypothesis, right, that the hunted species are going to be fearful and avoid the yards. Um, at, the, at the larger scale, the larger um, comparison of just or, uh, how uh, – urbanizes the landscape, we found that um, hunted species were less abundant at higher levels of urbanization in both countries, but the difference was much stronger in Germany. So in Germany, again, fewer animals in developed areas. Okay, so the next th thing we're going to look at is a temporal avoidance. You can see this little uh, uh, movie is showing animals walking on the trail and people walking on the trail, and we can use this kind of time series of data to see do animals avoid a trail after a person walks by, right? How much time does it take for a deer to show up after a person walks by? And I'm just going to show you one of these graphs, but this is an example of how we get at this. Um, on the y-axis, the detection intensity is um, basically how often or, or how likely is an animal to walk by. And then on the x-axis, day since last human, that is how long since a person walked in front of the camera. Um, and let's look at the green line first. This is for white-tailed deer in the United States at unhunted sites where they're not hunted. There's no effect of day since last human, right? That green line is straight across. Now that dashed line is the average and the green, the, the green shading is the error bar. So it shows how confidence, but basically um, you can see really no difference. It's like 85 or something the whole way across. So in unhunted areas, they don't care about people at all. But if you look at the hunted area, you can see that the detection intensity goes up as you have more time since the human last walked by. So somewhere around two to five days, uh, since a person walked by, you're still seeing some decrease. I don't, that doesn't mean no deer are going to show up, but there's a less of a chance that a deer is going to show up in areas that are hunted. So they do seem to be noticing. This is really cool. They seem to be noticing where they're hunted and where they're not hunted at a fairly small scale and responding accordingly by being more or less afraid of people. So over on the right, I've got that result that I just told you about, that white-tailed deer avoid people, but only where hunted. Where they're not hunted, they don't. Um, now, black bears avoided people who were hunted, but the interesting thing was they were actually attracted to people who were not hunted. I don't know how to explain this. It's a little surprising. Uh, you know, they're not really attacking people. Um, rather, it's a statistical artifact. It was a relatively small amount, but there was this, this phenomenon where it seemed like when a person walked by, bears were more likely to walk by. So I don't know, maybe someone can suggest uh, afterwards a, a good hypothesis to explain that one, because I, I don't have a good idea. Um, the hogs avoid people at all sites in Germany. Um, and interestingly, the, 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 the roe deer um, did not match our hypothesis. They actually avoided people only at the unhunted sites, not at the hunted sites. So that's a little weird. We don't totally know how to explain this. It might be a statistical artifact because we didn't have a whole lot of people at our hunted sites. Um, so we might not have had a great situation to actually test this, um, but it was a bit of a quirky result. So to kind of uh, come to some conclusions on our hypothesis testing, um, we predicted that the overall abundance of hunted species would be greater in the United States, and that was supported. Um, we predicted that hunted species in Germany would uh, avoid people more, would be more afraid. And we definitely found that by the fact that they avoid the yards, and the United States, turkeys and, and bears, uh, turkeys and deer certainly don't avoid the yards. Uh, we didn't have bears in yards, but if we had moved the study to Asheville, we probably would. Um, hunted species in Germany were especially less common in developed areas. And in both countries, hunted species uh, temporarily avoided humans more 
in hunted than unhunted areas, except for roe deer. That was the one that that's one of our uh, hypothesis that was not supported. So overall, it does seem that um, hunters can induce fear, and that if you have stronger, uh, more intense hunting, it's uh, more intense effects. Um, but what is the what's what's the uh, so what? Who cares? What are the what are the implications of this? Um, on the rest of the ecosystem. And I've got a picture here. You can see this deer is destroying a little oak sapling there. And, you know, deer are really big herbivores. Uh, they eat lots of stuff. Um, they eat my garden. It, well, I have to fence my garden or they would eat it. And any plant that I don't have fenced in, they munch on. Um, and so, and actually it's interesting. I can tell in my own yard, if it's closer to the house, they're less likely to eat it. So there is still a little fear in the yard, but they're certainly all over my yard. Um, and so to, to try to put some math on this, we thought, well, let's, let's try to estimate the ecological impact um, of a species by the, with this simple equation. How much time do they spend in front of the camera? Uh, how much do they weigh? We just use a species average for weight. Um, and what do they eat? And we use the species average for diet. Um, and so not perfect, but in, in terms of sort of getting an order of magnitude of how much ecological pressure is a species putting on a particular habitat, we can do this. And if you look at, this is our results for, um, for uh, plant eaters, for herbivory in the United States, you can see uh, white-tailed deer is the biggest component, um, turkey less, bears to some extent, um, and pretty similar across yards, open areas, and forests, because deer are in all those places for about the same amount. And so it's pretty similar herbivory levels across those. In Germany, it's totally different. Right there, you can see almost no herbivory of any kind in yards, right? The deer aren't there, and none of the other things that are there are really herbivores, other than the rabbits, and they don't do that much because um, they're so small. Um, and then you can see when you get out to the forest, the open areas, and you have more herbivory uh, getting up to be uh, closer to what we have, but still lower. So North Carolina yards are facing 25 times more potential herbivory than German yards. On the other hand, the German yards have a lot more uh, uh, predation, it, you know, because there's so many red foxes, which are a predator, that if a mouse, you know, shows up in a German backyard, they're probably going to get munched, if not by the red fox, by the stone marten or the badger. Um, and I've got the graph on the right kind of crunched down because I wanted to line the axes up between the two graphs. Uh, so you can see overall um, predation rates in the United States are lower, and it's kind of a mix of, rac of possums, raccoons, gray fox, coyotes. I, you know, raccoons aren't a super predator, but certainly they're, they'll eat frogs and, and eat a mouse if they can get it. Um, so you can see overall much lower uh, predation risk in American yards. Uh, and if you look at the forest, they're roughly kind of similar levels. So what about this trees before game um, uh, sort of philosophy that they have in Germany? Is it working? Well, if you look over there on the left side, you see the hunted and unhunted forests. This is just forests. How much herbivory uh, is there? Um, and you can see that the hunted forests have about half or even less than half the herbivory at, that, to be expected as the unhunted forest. So definitely in Germany, that is working. Over on the United States side, uh, there is a slight reduction of herbivory, um, but not by, a, not by a lot, by about 10%. So uh, the hunters in Germany are... Um, reducing the numbers and also, you know, in increasing the fear, which is resulting in uh, less herbivory on their forests. So to kind of come to some conclusions and wrap up, um, you know, our original questions, can human hunters create a landscape of fear for wildlife? Yes. We found that animals can recognize humans as predators um, and that they will change their use of the landscape due to fear of people. Even within the United States, deer seem to know when they're in a hunted forest or an unhunted forest, they'll be more or less afraid of people at that situation. Um, but then at these bigger scale differences between Germany and the United States, where you have much higher hunting intensity over there, we see even stronger differences. So hunting in North Carolina is having some fear effect, but hunting in Germany seems to have a much bigger fear effect. Um, and, uh, you know, it's up to us. We, we, we're a democracy and, and uh, uh, we can you know, decide if we want to change hunting regulations not necessarily through voting, right, but through, you know, sort of sharing your opinion with the Game Commission of, of, of do we want to have um, uh, more hunting uh, to sort of try to increase 
uh, the fear of animals towards humans and maybe also decrease their population. So uh, that's the end of my talk and uh, happy to stay, uh, stay around for questions if anyone has any questions. Thank you so much for uh, joining us at this Darwin Day celebration. Yes, I mean, I think this is really, really interesting. Thank you so much, uh, Roland. Uh, we do have a question from Katie. Uh, very early on in uh, in your talk, um, she was uh, asking, like, typically hunters will take down like big, healthy deer um, instead of the small, sick ones um, that predators would typically just take. Um, are we seeing fewer, larger, healthier deer because of that? Yeah, that's a great a great question, um, and uh, and very very well. Um, described as well right and so um the there is some evidence of that there's a really interesting study on bighorn sheep where the hunters were shooting the sheep with the biggest horns right and one of the biggest trophy um and it turns out over time the 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 horn size decreased because the animals that had the larger horns um uh, you know, became uh, more likely to die early and less likely to reproduce, which is like exactly the opposite of what they wanted. And so um, there's actually a, a group in the United States um, uh, that, that um, argues for what they call quality deer management, which is this idea that a quality deer is a large deer, especially a male with a buck, right? And so often they want to have, you know, the, and so they recognize that if we sh only shoot the big bucks, we're, we're going to, um, um, we're going to end up with smaller bucks and that's not what we want. And so they sort of manage differently, manage, uh, try to also shoot some does um, and try to let some of the young males uh, walk basically saying, okay, well, you know, a lot of hunters will see a young male and say, well, I I'm going to let, I'm going to get him next year, you know, when, when he gets a little, a little bigger. Um, and, you know, I think in terms of your, you know, your question of are, are we letting the sick ones survive? You know, I think there are other, other, we're not the only, you know, coyotes can take down a sick one too. So we, we do have coyotes. Coyotes can kill deer. You know, I don't mean to, to say that they're never going to kill deer, but they're not very good at it. They don't cooperatively hunt as well as wolves do. Um, and so they'll take the sick ones for sure. Right. If anyone's, you know, got a broken leg from getting hit, hit by a car or something, they'll finish them off. Um, and so there is some, some of that happening um, uh, still, still out there. Right. Yes. That's right. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, and we also have a question about the pandemic, basically. Uh, oh, yes, Katie says thank you. <laughs> um, so during this pandemic, we have seen animals on the streets, right? And, and they're coming closer to our house as well, and, and even in big cities all around the world. So what do you think um, about this behavior? Um, could that uh, bring like any bad encounters? Uh? Yeah, well, this is an interesting question. Um, I think we, I've been involved in a lot of discussions about this. And honestly, um, you know, as a scientist, I want to see the data. And, you know, a lot of times people are seeing animals near their houses, but people are spending a lot more time in their houses. So is it because the animals, you know, maybe the animals were always there. Um, and so we actually are pulling together, maybe for next Darwin Day, I can talk on this. We're pulling together right now a giant camera trap data set from all around the world uh, from biologists who had cameras out before the pandemic and then during the pandemic. So we can make this comparison at the same site before and during. It's a great sort of experiment. I mean, it's a terrible experiment, right? I'm sorry that we're doing this experiment, but, uh, you know, we certainly don't, uh, don't root for the pandemic. But given that the pandemic has happened and we had these big changes in human behavior, we're using camera traps to evaluate that. Um, and, uh, and see if, you know, is there really an increase or is it just changes in, in what people see? And then we'd be able to answer your question of, you know, are we gonna have more interactions that could be problematic? Um, or are we gonna have more interactions that are nice, that are, are good? I mean, I, you know, there's a real positive um, aspect to seeing wildlife on a daily basis, right? And be, being around nature has all kinds of, be of health benefits. And um, as much as I, curse at the deer when they chew on my garden. I kind of, you know, it's kind of nice seeing them down there. I don't feed them or anything like that. I don't want to really encourage them, but you know, there are these benefits. Um, you know, there's also some potential downsides. They eat your garden, right? The, the coyotes can, can potentially threaten your cats. Um, 
uh, and there's in theory, right. There could also be some, some uh, exchange of diseases between humans and pets and, and wildlife. And so, you know, anytime you get that kind of interaction, that's a possibility. Um, and so, but we, I can't sort of, you know, extrapolate too much on that until I know what do the numbers actually say about which species became more or less common near, near, near people due to the pandemic. So, uh, we'll see. There's a couple studies that are starting to come out now and our own, our own data set, we're, we're, we're just starting to, to dig into it now. So maybe by next year, I'll have some results to share. Yeah, right. Yeah, I think that would be very interesting to kind of like see what comes out of that uh, research, definitely. Well, based on that, actually, we have another question because you talked about fear of predation and how that affects where and when animals move through the landscape. But what about cars and traffic? Because in the beginning, you were talking about so many deer get hit by cars. So you would think, you know, that they would develop some kind of fear for cars. But do you, are there any studies that confirm this or? Good question. I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question, but that, that would not be, that's a good question. And because, you know, the a lot of these roadsides have great grass to graze on, right? So deer, yeah, deer you. like the open areas in the grass. And so they're going to have this sort of, like on one hand, this should be good because it's yummy and delicious. But on the other hand, it's dangerous. And, you know, what what do they see in cars? Do you know, do they recognize the danger of cars? Do they even realize there are people inside those cars? I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, this would be a, a, a relatively straightforward. Uh, if you had some animals that you're radio tracking, you could see, do they spend more time, more, more time than you would expect close to roads? Uh, is it at certain times of day or something like that? And I'm sure someone's done that study, but I don't yeah. know the answer off the top of my head. I do know that, um, uh, you know, I think it'll be interesting to look at how the pandemic, because during the pandemic, the traffic decreased. Right. Uh, and so if we see a road effect in there as well, where uh, the the camera traps that were close to the road maybe had more uh, um, more animals during the, 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 the pandemic. So we'll definitely look at that. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, because the other thing that I'm also thinking about is like, uh, can uh, fear, uh, you know, learning about fear and can that be kind of like transmitted to uh, offspring, like whatever the parents have encountered, can they kind of like teach that to their offspring as well? I mean, there's so yeah. many interesting questions. Well, that's a super interesting question. And um, we don't, you know, we don't really know how, what are the cues that these animals are picking up on that mm -hmm suggests that they should be afraid. Um, and, and, you know, if, if a hunter shoots a deer, that deer is no longer in the population, right? Yeah, exactly. So how do the other deer realize that a hunt, that, that people are dangerous? Exactly. You know, I really don't know the answer to that question. Um, but there, there, there's definitely, um, you know, so in theory, it could be an evolutionary response that would take many generations where the ones that were generally more afraid of people would survive better. And the ones that were less afraid of people would die. And over many generations, you know, natural selection would select for that. So that's one possibility, but we've definitely seen some examples where the fear effect can kick in right away. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's definitely a behavioral thing and a learned thing. Um, there's a really interesting paper from Wisconsin just recently that showed that, as soon as wolves establish in a county, the deer start behaving differently. Like immediately that exact same year, there's like no, no, no lag. They seem to know right away and they're responding right away. So that suggests that that's a behavioral thing. That's not like an evolutionary mechanism that's going to take hundred years. Right. Yes. Very interesting. Now, it seems like um, during your research, you were using a lot of these camera traps. And um, I'm not sure how long this um, research has been going on between, you know, the US and, and, and uh, Germany. Um, but um, and I also wonder, like, how many hours of footage do you have to kind of go through, you know, all this to kind of like deduct what's happening? Um, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So, um, we get, uh, we generally take photographs, not, not, not videos and we get, oh. um, yeah, uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of pictures. Um, and so 
we have um, a, a data management system. Initially, we used something called eMammal to help process photographs, and now we're we're using um, uh, something called artificial, or something called uh, wildlife in, uh, insights, which has we're just now starting to have some um, artificial intelligence built in, so the computer can help identify the animals. We're just getting that um, sort of working right now. It's still not super accurate, but it, it definitely can speed things along so you can go through that. But you get all kinds of, um, uh, you know, when you get so many pictures, most of them are pretty boring, right? It's just like a squirrel, like walking by, or it's just like the leg of a deer. You can't even see the whole animal or something like that. Um, but, you know, you run enough of those and you get some great ones every once in a while, or you get some really interesting behaviors of, you know, a predator praising, you know, chasing a prey or two animals fighting or interacting or all kinds of interesting things. So um, we see you, you learn a lot about the animals just by looking at the pictures. Right. And so do you work with citizen science uh, scientists or um, I mean, how does that work? Because if people would be interested, for instance, in uh, doing this type of research or helping as a citizen science scientist, um, and they, they get like a camera trap. How do they have to install that like in, in their yard? Like, is there like a protocol that goes along with that? Yeah. So the North Carolina project was a citizen science project. It's no longer running, but it okay. was, um, it was sponsored by the wildlife resources commission and run out of here at the museum. And so we would loan people cameras, they would run them and then upload the data for us. And, and we would get to use, use those pictures and those data, um, in Germany. We we worked with the we worked with citizen scientists in that we got perm permission to run the cameras on their land, but we ran the cameras ourselves. Our our team ran the cameras just to make it a little bit more simple. We would of course let them see all the pictures so they could see all the animals that are in their backyard. Um, but we were a little bit more involved because it's still it's a bit of work to um, go through all the pictures and identify them all. Yeah, I can imagine because um, there's like uh, some kind of like Zooniverse. I think it's one of those platforms where citizen science citizen scientists can just kind of like um, help out, right? I'm not sure is that one of those platforms that you use. That we do not use Zooniverse, but Zooniverse is a platform where you can go look at pictures that other people have collected. So usually, it's scientists yeah. will collect a lot of pictures, and they'll put and they'll be like, "Oh my God, I, I can't go through all these pictures. Let me." ask the you know help from the crowd and so they'll mm -hmm. crowdsource this and they'll ask for volunteers to go through and look at the pictures and they'll try to get maybe each picture looked at by five people to kind of confirm that yes this is definitely a deer and if they all agree then you know it's a deer if they disagree then they might look a little closer um so that was that was not an approach that we used but um it is one that's out there and you know we're kind of hoping that the artificial intelligence will get good enough that it will be able to really help us with this you know moving forward in the future yeah, and then you don't need people really looking at pictures all the yeah. <laughs> yeah, or at least do, doing it in a more efficient way. Um, right. You know, I think looking at the pictures is still going to be important, but um, uh, uh, you know, this spent a lot of hours just flipping through squirrels in North Carolina that are running around people's backyards, and that gets old after a while. I can imagine. Yeah, it seems like you are using a lot of the new technologies um, when you're like studying these free ranging animals, but. Are there also any of the traditional methods that you keep on using? Sure. Yeah. Well, so, um, you know, for sure the, um, you know, the cameras are, I mean, in some ways they're new technology, but in some ways we've actually been using them for almost a hundred years now. So, um, you know, but we're using digital cameras now and, and we're getting a lot, a lot more information, but, you know, cameras have actually always been a tool that we have used because, you know, the animals, they, they, they do have fear, right? If you're there, they're going to be behaving differently. And so to just sit there and observe them with your binoculars, um, you, you don't know if that's really, you know, kind of what they do on their own. Um, but, uh, you know, also in our, in our work, we, we do use a lot of museum specimens. So that's, uh, you know, an important part of uh, looking at DNA samples or measuring skulls or looking at bone samples, using the information here in the collections at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences to ask research questions as well, and still, you know, adding to those collections so that we can have, you know, what's going on in North Carolina right now, comparing that to what was going on 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 100 years ago, you know, these museum specimens become these kind of, of uh, time capsules to sort of see uh, what was the world like in, you know, 1950. Uh, and, and, you know, we have that information here at the museum. So um, it's, a, it's a really useful tool for asking all sorts of questions.
Right, yes. Oh, and there's just another question that just popped up from Katie. Um, so she asks, um, on camera traps, are you able to distinguish between individuals to determine how many are in the area? Or are you looking more for the behavior and where they are? And she's talking about deer in particular. Yeah, good question. So um, usually not because a doe looks like a doe looks like a doe, right? And a black, you know, the animals look alike. For There are cases with like jaguars that have spots or zebras that have these great stripes where you can, you know, quite easily identify individuals. Um, in North America, there's not many species that fit that. And so in those cases, um, we use a detection rate where it's just how many times did an animal walk in front of the, of the camera per day? And, uh, you know, that could be the same animal passing by every day. But, you know, what you find is if you have one site where, you know, you only got one picture of a deer in like 30 days and another site where you got 30 pictures in 30 days, you know, this site is much more important. It's much more valuable to those animals. So you're still, you can learn a lot about it. Um, and with deer, the male deer during um, fall, you can recognize individually based on their antlers. And so we have done that analysis with male deer. Um, and you can use, once you get those individual identifications, you can use something called a mark recapture analysis where you're, you're counting individuals and figuring out how often do you recapture, right? It's not actually a capture, it's a photograph the same individual, and then you can start to get an idea of how many individuals are out there that you never captured, and you can get a total density estimate. Um, and so we have done that for quite a lot of sites um, across North, North Carolina and across the East with deer. And the nice thing is we can then use that estimate to compare with the detection rate measure that we use. And we find that they're tightly, that, that they're positively correlated, right? So there is a, there's definitely a relationship where the more often you get a picture, the more animals there are in the environment in total. Uh, and we've, we've sort of calibrated that with deer. Hopefully it's true with the other species, but we haven't been able to do that. Mm, very interesting, yes. Um, so, well, we are almost near the end, but um, I think we can squeeze in one last question. And it would be more about um, how did you start doing this? Um, I mean, what inspired you actually to do this type of, um, you know, research and um, also like, what did you have to do to actually get to where you are right now? And sure. Talking, yeah. Yeah. So I've always been um, really interested in science and also interested in nature. But for a long time, when I was growing up, they were kind of separate things. Um, I was out in the, I was a boy scout and I was running around the woods. And then I was interested in like physics and biology and genetics. And they were sort of these different things. And um, so I went to college and I studied biology and I got a, a job in a lab over the summer doing research at a medical school, which should have been great, but I really didn't like it that much. And I was like, oh, maybe, you know, maybe I don't want to be in a lab all the time. So I started thinking, well, you know, can I actually combine these two interests of mine? And is there a way to sort of do science of nature? And so that's what kind of got me into this other realm. And, you know, then I realized that, you know, some of this work can have really um, applied consequences of, of making a difference for conservation, helping us protect nature, helping get people, you know, to understand more about the animals, to connect with the animals, to become, you know, excited and passionate about the, the, the wildlife and the, and the nature that's out there, um, whether it's in their backyard or out in some, you know, foreign remote place. And so that's really uh, got, got me uh, kind of motivated to go into it. I, I got a PhD at the University of Tennessee and then have worked at a couple different museums over the years. Yeah, that's very interesting. Well, thank you so much. That was really an interesting talk. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. I learned a lot. I hope you all learned a lot as well. And maybe you're inspired now, uh, you know, to maybe participate in one of the citizen science projects, because I know that there's still, uh, the museum still offers a, a few of those. Um, so as always, I would love to thank uh, our, um, anonymous sponsor and I'm going to actually share uh, my last um, page with you all. Um, hope I can do this. Mm, sorry. Uh, 